the board of directors to please stand up. This is anyone who's there. Uh, so at this front table, we have, yeah, thank, thank you for helping us get here, everybody. Uh, at this front table, we have Jessica Rousset and Allison Renna, who are the grad student representatives. We have the former uh, president, Mark Peterson, uh, who is the one who taught our organization to think really clearly about what it means to have fun at our conferences. That's his presidential theme. We have Sarah Robinson, uh, Elizabeth Allison, who sat down. Uh, uh, Robin Veldman, who re remembered to stand up, and uh, anybody else who I, oh, uh, Lisa, this is who I was looking for. Uh, so Lisa Sedaris is currently president-elect, uh, but not for much longer. She will be the next president of the organization, and I want to thank her uh, for all the work she did in helping sort of set the intellectual tone for the great conversation we had uh, over the last couple of days. Uh, so, um, also, for any of you who are interested in remaining involved with the Society beyond uh, tomorrow afternoon, uh, I invite you to find one of the people who stood up and, and talk to them about what it means to get involved in the leadership or to think about future conferences. Uh, and for anybody who has a blue sticker on their name tags, those are people you can talk to about getting involved with the work of the journal. So just remember, we, we, we act, we're a better, stronger, more vibrant society if we get uh, as many people as we can involved. So we want to hear from you. Um, so I would like to invite to the podium uh, the founder of the society, Bron Taylor, who's going to present our Lifetime Achievement Award. And then after that, we're going to talk about our Graduate and Travel Award. So Bron, please come on up. Hey everybody, um, we are lucky people. This became the mantra during a float trip down the Yampa River, the last undammed wild tributary to the Colorado River a few years ago. I was privileged to be on that river along with a group of radical environmental activists whom I first met in the early 1990s while doing participant observation research on a then unusual alliance between indigenous and environmental activists resisting a massive telescope project underway on Mount Graham in southeastern Arizona. Both groups, in their own and intersecting ways, considered the mountain and its creatures sacred and the construction of the scopes to be a desecrating act. In 1993, I was lucky to be invited to talk about radical environmental movements and such campaigns and their earth and spiritualities at a conference on indigenous wisdom and the environment. It took place in Killarney, Ireland. There I heard for the first time Winona's powerful voice. And somehow I ended up with her and the indigenous Scottish rights land activist, Alistair McIntosh, at a pub having a long conversation. If we are all stardust, as many cosmologists say, I knew immediately that I was witnessing an unusually bright manifestation of one. Although then in only in her early 30s, since graduating from Harvard University in economics a decade earlier, she had already established herself as a leader in movements promoting indigenous sovereignty and environmental sanity. And soon after our first encounter, she began publishing a series of books that exemplify the value and importance of engaged scholarship. Her activism in writing has been remarkably diverse. She's worked on community development, including restoring organic hemp farming on, and practices on the White Earth Reservation, her home, focusing attention on food and energy sustainability and sovereignty, twice running under the Green Party banner for Vice President of the United States in a ticket with Ralph Nader, and recently she served as a lead water protector in the resistance to the Dakota Access Pipeline. Her latest book tells that story. I especially love the way she keeps promoting a reverence for all life, as is reflected, for example, in the titles of two of her books, All Our Relations and Recovering the Sacred. Since my first encounter with Winona, I've been lucky to have several path crossings. I was grateful she found time to help me think about and through the difficulties I had been witnessing as Greens and Native American activists sought to build alliances in the Mount Graham campaign. 
as I was writing, Earth and Spirituality or Cultural Genocide, Radical Environmentalism's Appropriation of Native American Spirituality, she provided great nuance and insight. And we were all lucky when she agreed to join us as a keynote speaker during the 2016 conference celebrating this society's 10th anniversary. I've long thought about both disadvantages and privileges, about privileges I keep returning to the greatest one, to be a complex multicellular organism able to experience life on planet Earth, the only place in space that we know for sure life exists. Whatever challenge we, challenges we have had and still have and yet will face, we are all in that regard exceptionally privileged. And as you look around this room, Consider how privileged you are to be here and in relation to all of these remarkable creatures who, like you, are striving to understand your place in the biosphere and responsibilities within it. Many of uh, the people in this room are already, or soon will be, cherished lifelong friends. Now, even if tonight Winona must be with us through a technologically mediated network, we are grateful to be among her many relations. We are lucky people. And I can't wait any longer to hear her musings on this auspicious occasion. And so it is my own distinct privilege to give the floor, or perhaps I should say the screen in this case, to my friend Winona LeDuc. Uh, uh, for uh, your kind words, and I, I hope you can all hear me out there in the in the world where you are. I am in, in northern Minnesota, Oma A King. That's how we would call it, Oma A King, which is the land to which the people belong. I'm up here on the White Earth Reservation where I live and continue uh, the work that we have uh, instructions for for thousands of years to take care of the land and to take care of the water. And I was I I, I went to the mail and I and I received this so I want to thank you for this Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, I'm really honored to accept this award. Um, it's really the work of a lot of people in my community. I get to talk about it. But uh, thank you very much for this, uh, for this honor. It's funny to get a Lifetime Achievement Award because I was planning on hanging out for a little bit longer. Um, but you know, when you start reading that resume, it looks like I'm really, really, really old. <laughs> And I'm not that old, but I'm a pun on my mother is 90 and that's about uh, I, I got a, a couple decades on that one So I'm gonna go for that and try to do do my best to hang in here and not only uh, As my friend uh, Jane Fonda would say make good trouble, but more than that try to do the right thing. So here I am up here at my farm um, in the in the deep north as we call it or Ah King, the land to which the people belong. And, and, you know, I see the same world that you see. And it is this moment in time that we are born into, which is a time really of prophecies. It is a time of prophecies of, of, the, of you know, our ancient prophecies that are, that are really coming to pass. And it is a time when we remember our teachings. Now, first I'm gonna talk about this teaching, which is a long time ago, maybe around 1100 is when they say, I don't really know. But it was a time of the great law of the Haudenosaunee had been uh, had they had come to that agreement, and and they came the six nations came to see our people the Anishinaabe and we made an agreement. It's called the One Dish, One Spoon Treaty, or the One Dish One Spoon Wampum. And that was signed in. It was represented as a wampum belt, and it's called which you know, is made of quahog shells or clam shells. And it is said that that, that belt, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. You're kind okay. of Okay, well, I'm still talking. I got a couple minutes, right? Yes, you got, take, you got the floor. Okay, just like, I was like, wait, did you tell me to get off? No, I just started. Okay, so look, this agreement, so one dish, it was, it was an agreement between people that said, we all eat from one dish. That's what the teaching is. We all eat from one dish. And you know, my relatives in Dinaway Magadachuk, we all eat from one dish. And uh, then they said that we all use one spoon, which in our teachings as Anishinaabe people, like uh, at ceremonies, we feed with one spoon to everyone. But now with, with 
you know, COVID, we use sippy cups sometimes. But the point is, is that we share because we are relatives. And that teaching is very, is, is, is a teaching that is of this time. It is of that time and it is of this time. And it is an indigenous teaching that has, you know, such significance in this moment we're in. As I look around there, I see what you see, which is catastrophes of biblical proportions at all levels. You know, the fires, the, the melting of the ice caps, the obvious collapse of very immature country, the United States, with the problems of the executive branch and the legislative and the judicial branch. You know, we can see that there is chaos all around. And so in that, you know, we find that, oh, thank you. That's cool. Now I can see that there's a lot of people in the room. That's cool. I had no idea. You know, it's like I thought that I was just talking to Braun or something. Oh, hello. Nice to see you all. I hope you are warm down there and, and try not to use too much fossil fuels, okay? Um, no, I'm, so let's get back to my speech. But basically, you know, that's what I'm going to say. So look, you know, our old people talked about this time. They talked about, you know, I'm, you know, I'm 63 years old. And I hung out with a lot of really, really cool elders, it turns out. Great, great leaders. And I, and I, my father was a great leader. And we all, like, I got to listen to these guys speak. And women. And they talked about, uh, the whole piece talked about a time when a gourd of ashes would fall. And they said that that, you know, as described, the prophets would talk about, they, they said that that was the atomic bomb. And then the whole piece talked about a new world would be born at the time there was a web in the sky. Did y'all just hear me say that? A web in the sky, right? So I heard that, and, and we heard that in the 70s, and we didn't know what a web in the sky was. We thought it was like Star Wars or something. Well, you know what the web in the sky is? Well, how I got to you today, the World Wide Web. That's what those Hopis were talking about a thousand years ago when they wrote that prophecy. My father talked about the time when the, there would be no food in the store. Well, I just saw that during the pandemic. You know, and the pandemic is really, uh, you know, just, just a, 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 look, a good look at the chaos of, of the loss of biodiversity, the use of fossil fuels, and the insanity of consumer society. Well, you know, we see these, these, all of these moments happen. And in our prophecies as Anishinaabe, this is called the time of the seventh fire. This is said that our people would have a choice between two paths. They said one path is well-worn and scorched. The other path, they said, is not well worn and it is green. And it would be our choice upon which path to embark, the scorched path or the green path. Now, my friends, my friends, I'm telling you, this is just not for the Anishinaabe. This is for all of us. You got to make a choice upon which path you're going to embark, or which, path, which path you're going to stay on, the scorched path or the green path. So, you know, as we look around, you know, we can see that everything is shaking. You know, everything is shaking all around us and the great volcanoes are going off. And so take a good breath. You are born into a time of prophecies. That's what we are born into. We are born into a time of prophecies and, and we see the instructions of what it is to do, you know, which is a lot of the work that, that you are undertaking, the spiritual work, you know, the work of nature and the work of how one lives as a good human being. You know, so it is important that your voices or our voices are, are, are heard at our scene. But we know that in this time, we have time to make spiritual change. We have a responsibility to make economic, social, technological changes to do the right thing. And so I say, you know, think good. Be coherent thinkers. That's what the great John Trudeau would say is be coherent in these times when there is all, all crazy around us. Know that these are the times of prophecy. And in these times of prophecy, it is our opportunity to be the greatest spiritual beings ever. You know, so I summon you to, to ask you to summon up your courage and, uh, you know, take a step towards that. And I'm grateful tonight that I have this opportunity to speak with you and to receive this Lifetime Achievement Award. You know, I'm very grateful for this award that you have given me. It's really nice to get recognition for such, from, you know, some such, I won't say just smart people like you, but you guys are like super academics and such, you know? <laughs> I mean, you look pretty cool and all, but basically, you know, I'm a person who lives on a reservation in northern Minnesota and, and practices a way of life that's a thousand years old and tries to tell the story of that life. You know, I'm honored to be in your company tonight, 
and to say, you know, we all eat from one dish and we all have one spoon. And thank you again for having me and really the best to you in your work. Miigwech. Thank you, Nora. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. No, it's really cool. So go see those Apache people. You gonna go see the Apaches tomorrow? That's good. Be with the people fighting for their spiritual practice. Thanks for joining us, Winona, and persevere, my friend. Yes, thank you so much, and really have a good evening and the best to all of you in the days ahead. Wish you were here. So that was great, everybody. I'm glad we were able to connect with her remotely. Uh, I hope um, we have other opportunities to honor her work again in the future. So I would like to invite Allison Renna, one of the graduate student representatives on the board, uh, to recognize the travel grant recipients for the conference, please. Hello. Thank you. My name is Allison Renna. I'm a PhD candidate in Religion and Modernity and History of Science at Yale University and a member of the board. It's my honor tonight to recognize the winners of our travel awards. The ISSRNC offers all panelists the opportunity to apply for a travel grant funding for each conference. Travel grants give the increasing number of scholars without reliable research or travel funding the chance to attend the conference and present their work with less financial strain. Thank you to all of you here your dues help provide other scholars working at the intersection of religion, nature, and culture with the opportunity to attend our conference and receive recognition for their work. Travel grant applicants are anonymously reviewed by the awards committee and are distributed on the basis of need for in-person conference participation. Priority is given to graduate students, international scholars, contingent faculty, and independent scholars without institutional support. While we cannot always provide support for everyone who applies, we endeavor to support as many people as possible for each conference. This year, the ISSRNC was pleased to provide over $10,000 in support to travel grant awardees. This, so I'm going to go through the list. Um, there's a number of you here. You're welcome to stand. You don't have to. The first, Alicia Breton from Indiana University. The second, Theodora Kamara from Northeastern Seminary. Mariniela Compenteri from the University of California, Santa Barbara. Yael Danzak from the Free University of Brussels, Belgium. Nathan Jowers from Georgetown University. Kyle Kaplan from the University of California, Santa Barbara. Caitlin Cosman from Yale University. David Krantz from Arizona State University. Maya Luta from Rice University. Adelaide Mandeville from Harvard University. Brady McCartney, independent scholar. Sarah Meyer, independent scholar. Sarah Nehar, Syracuse University. Libby O'Neill, Yale University. Margot Kreider Robinson, University of Kentucky. Sarah Robinson, independent scholar. Harrison Rosenberg, University of Florida. 
Jason Sexton, University of California, Los Angeles. Jeremy Sorgan, University of California, Berkeley. Emily Theus, Yale University. And Dominic Wilkins, Syracuse University. I want to thank the palms of your hands for their endurance and each of you in attendance for making these scholars exceptional work visible. Thank you and congratulations to every recipient. Your work enriches our knowledge of what the world is and your presence empowers the hope of an intellectual community that keeps a serious eye to the future. Thank you. So the final award presentation for the evening will be Jessica Baudet, who is uh, one of the other graduate student representatives on the board, uh, an almost PhD candidate, soon to be PhD candidate here at Arizona State University, uh, and she'll recognize the a recipient of the graduate student paper award. Thank you. Dr. Berry is my advisor, extraordinaire as I'm sure you can imagine. So um, at each conference, the ISSRNC selects one paper to receive a merit-based award for best graduate student paper. Graduate students were asked to submit their full conference papers and the submissions were anonymously reviewed by us, the awards committee. Several previous award winners have gone on to publish their papers in the Journal for the Study of Religion, Nature, and Culture which we hope will be the case this year, and not necessarily just for the winners. The journal exists as a space for all of us, graduate students and PhDs, to share ideas in the spirit of what Editor-in-Chief Bron Taylor has called taboo-free inquiry. As has been the case in previous years, we were delighted by the quality of graduate student submissions and pleased to see their breadth of topics and approaches. We are proud to be a society that offers suitable intellectual habitat for approaches as diverse as ethnography, textual exegesis, literary criticism, and interdisciplinary theorizing, to mention a few of the approaches found in the papers that were submitted this year. It is a challenge, however, to come up with one best paper when the criteria for excellence is different. Um, in different disciplines. We want to emphasize that we did agree about some of the strongest contenders, but there was no easy consensus when it came down to picking just two for special recognition. And that is as it should be. In a world as complicated as ours, there can be no one best paper, but the best papers help us see a complicated world in new ways. That brings me to the first award which will be for honorable mention. Among the many strong contenders, we were particularly impressed with the quality of papers in the panel on Gaia. With respect to two very strong papers that were submitted, we would like to award honorable mention to Caitlin Kosman, PhD student at Yale University, for her paper, Gaia as Myth and Politics. Congratulations, Caitlin. And now for the first place award, this was another very difficult decision, but ultimately the committee members could agree that one paper had a particularly impressive mix, being very well written, novel in terms of its contribution, and of interest to scholars from a range of disciplinary backgrounds. So the award for first place goes to Mai Luta, PhD student at Rice University, for her paper, Cosmic Chaos and Transformation in Scientific Quranic Exegesis. Congratulations, Mai. We 
want to offer our thanks to all who submitted papers this year for fascinating us, challenging us, and for surprising us. Your energy and ideas are a vital part of the important conversations we are having and hope to continue to have about the interrelationships between religion, nature, and culture. Thank you, everybody. Okay, done with the podium stuff. Everybody get back to the tables and the good conversation. Eat, drink, be merry. There's more food still at the buffet and the bar remains open for 30 minutes. So get to it, people.